today it comes from John chapter 12, it's verses 1 through 8. It says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, the one who Jesus had raised from the dead. And so they gave him a dinner for him, and there Martha was serving them, and Lazarus was one of those who was reclining at the table with him. And then Mary took a pound of a fragrant oil, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair, so that the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, Why wasn't this fragrant oil sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag, and he was still part of what was put into it. And Jesus answered, Leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I was reading our text for today, and uh, this uh, this is by the way, this is not a theological statement at all, but it does uh, it does come to my mind to see how my brain works a little bit here as I was reading this text over and over and preparing. I began to wonder just how long Mary's hair really had to be in order for her to be able to dry Jesus' feet with her hair. And then I also thought, well, why in the world, Mary, did you not have a towel handy where you could take this and use it? We're, being, we're talking about being prepared. And so why in the world did Mary not have a towel around her? Not only that, but can you imagine the smell that this perfume left throughout the whole entire house? It's a very expensive perfume and costly. And not only that, but on top of that, can you imagine all the people next week as Mary was walking to the market or wherever she went, they were probably walking behind her and they were probably smelling her hair and saying, Mary, where in the world did you get this wonderful shampoo that you're using? I can't imagine that. I want to uh, take a moment and we'll come back to this importance of the expense and the type of, uh, of uh, perfume that was used and the implications for its future. But also, I want to talk about the disciples today a little bit. And then Jesus. I want to talk about the main players in this particular short scripture that we read today. First of all, I want to bring to attention the fact that John shows Jesus pointing to the preparation that is to come and talking again about His upcoming death and resurrection. Now, this is the fourth time in the book of John, and this is only 12 chapters in, that Jesus has mentioned His upcoming death and His resurrection that is to come. And the disciples, they're still pretty clueless. I've never seen such a clueless group of people in my whole entire life as these disciples were. But they look at Jesus and they're thinking, what in the world is He talking about? Jesus turns to them and says, you'll always have the poor with you, but you won't always have Me. And so I'm sure that probably caught them off guard a little bit because they probably looked at Jesus and they said, aren't you the one that's always advocating for us to go take care of the poor, clothe those that need clothing, take care of the poor that need food, feed those that are hungry, all this kind of stuff? Who are you, Jesus? Why are you saying this? Who in the world have you become that you're now telling us, don't worry about the poor so much, they'll always be with you. But... I will not be. See, in the disciples' head, they had it all planned out. Jesus was coming back with them. They were going to head into Jerusalem. They were going to have this triumphant entry. They were going to take back the city. Take back their people. They were going to be free from Roman rule because Jesus was coming to be the new king, the new Messiah, the one who was going to take everything back and make it the way that it used to be. It was all going to be better because Jesus was with them. But here's Jesus looking at them and saying, nope. I'm not going to be here forever. I'm not going to be around so long. Prepare for it. Get ready for it. You're not going to have me with you this whole entire time. So they probably look at each other and they say, oh my gosh. This Jesus is just another politician. He's saying one thing and he's doing another. 
And Mary is the one over here stuffing the ballot to make sure that Jesus wins the election in the end. Of course, Mary, she has a really good reason to want to take care of Jesus. She has a really good reason for that. Because he raised her brother from the dead. He raised, her from, he raised Lazarus from the dead. And another thing, she was not always the most nicest person in the world. If you look back in the scripture, if you look at a different story of the anointing, Mary is a sinful woman who washes Jesus' feet with her tears. And then, of course, dries them with her hair. This whole hair thing that we've talked about a little bit ago comes up again. But there is a love in her heart that goes beyond the love that the disciples have for Jesus. And it goes beyond Lazarus and Martha both. She loves Jesus. She cares about Him. She feels highly for Him. She takes care of Jesus. And then... She goes beyond that. She washes his feet. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want to get into the whole foot washing idea too highly. I know that we have foot washing ceremonies occasionally and things like that, but uh, when it comes to uh, feet, they're usually pretty stinky, and especially if you're one of these who has been traveling a whole lot like Jesus probably was, I can't imagine what kind of sand and grit might have been on his feet. But let's take a minute and let's look at Martha. What was Martha doing this time? Well, she was serving, right? If you look back at the previous story in Luke, you'll see that Martha was mad at Mary. She said, Mary, why aren't you coming to help me? I'm doing this all by myself. I'm taking care of all these people. Where are you at? You're just sitting here being a goof off. But Jesus turns to Martha and, she said, and he says, Martha, Mary knows what is important. See, Martha is busy with things of the world when she could be sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning from the Lord. But why is Martha not doing this? Why is she not so appreciative of Jesus? After all, Lazarus was her brother too. Jesus raised him up from the dead. Why is she not doing the same kind of things that Mary was? Why does she not have that love and that respect for Jesus? She was busying herself with everyday tasks. With the things of the world that have to be accomplished. She was worried about making sure that the dishes were done. She was worried about making sure that everybody's tea glass was full. She was worried about making sure that everyone had plenty to eat, was comfortable on their cushions or wherever it was that they were sitting. And she was not thinking about the fact that she had Jesus right there with her and among her. Her mind was on other things. Mary's mind was not. Mary's mind was on Jesus the whole time. So now let's take a look at these disciples for a minute, shall we? They are, like I said earlier, one of the most stubborn groups of people that I think I've ever encountered in anything that I've ever read. But it was specifically Judas here. Judas was the only disciple mentioned in this particular text. And he had rebuked Jesus, or, or Mary. He had rebuked Mary. He had said, Mary, what are you doing? That's money that I could be using to take care of the poor. That's a whole lot of money that you've just put into this one little old jar of this expensive perfume. And you've spent it and you poured it all out on Jesus. I could be taking care of the poor, the needy in the world. But then what does the scripture say about that? It says, Judas in the back of his mind was sitting there thinking, hey, I just missed 300 denarii that I could have put into that common purse that I'm stealing from all the time. Judas was a two-face. 
That's the only way that I can really put it. He said one thing. He put on a good act for everybody out in the public, out in the group of people that he was with. But in the back of his mind, his wheels are turning. He's thinking, my gosh, you just spent a whole lot of money that I could have had for myself. I could have bought me a donkey and I could have been riding along instead of having to walk with you guys. Or something like that. Judas was just plain old greedy. That's all there was to it. And he was the antagonist in this story. Just kind of like Martha was the antagonist in the Luke story, in the Luke scripture. See, both of these people, they represent caring for things of the world. The world has corrupted all these other people. The world has corrupted Judas to the point where he was just a common thief. The world has corrupted Mary to work, or Martha to where she is only thinking about taking care of the people that are around her, doing her everyday task, doing laundry, doing dishes, taking care of mowing the lawn, things like that. Everyday things. They had forgotten to look at the fact that Jesus was right there in front of them the whole time. And he was preparing them for what was to come. He was preparing them for what their lives needed to be after he was no longer around. I said I'd get back to talking about Mary for a little bit, so now I guess I should talk about her for a second. There is a uh, author who has done a commentary on the book of John. His name is Cruz. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And in his commentary, he says that a woman's hair her long hair was a source of great pride. It was great wonder and wonderful thing to have such long hair. It was a sign of great adoration and devotion that Mary would take her hair that she prized so highly and wipe Jesus' feet with it. Anytime that you see anointing mentioned in the, in the several times that this, is, this story is presented, you always see Mary using her hair to wipe Jesus' feet. Not only that, but this perfume that she was using was extremely, extremely expensive. It says in the same text that uh, it was expensive because of how it was extracted. It was extracted from a plant that it would have probably taken a whole, whole lot of plants to be able to make a pound of this expensive stuff. Can you imagine spending that amount of money on something that you were just about to dump on somebody's feet? I can't think about that. That would be kind of like me saying, hey, uh, I'm going I'm to go down to the store and I'm going to spend my whole entire year's wages on this big old glass of wine and then I'm going to dump it on somebody's feet and I'm going to wash them with that expensive glass of wine. It doesn't make any real common sense for most average people. But for Mary, it was the ultimate sign of her love and her respect for Jesus. It was an amazing thing that she did. It was a wonderful thing. Not only that, but Jesus says she was preparing for the future. She's preparing me for my burial, he says. Now, I'm not really sure that Mary actually knew what was about to happen. But I knew, though, do know that she knew how important Jesus really was. And doing this in this anointing, in this hair, in this perfume, she shows how important Jesus was to her. Now, Jesus makes this statement about always having the poor with him. And that probably amazed the disciples because this whole entire time he's been talking about take care of the poor, take care of the needy, feed the hungry, clothe those that need clothing. But Jesus says, she is preparing me for burial. You will not always have me with you. Now, I wonder if the disciples probably thought, who is this Jesus that's been around us all this time? Why is he saying this? Why is he not more concerned about the poor? They were probably thinking to themselves, we've got plenty of time to take care of you, Jesus. We could go into town. We could buy some of this oil for ourselves if we wanted to. They did not realize how short an amount of time that they had left. 
with Jesus. They didn't realize it. It's also, I think, worth mentioning here that the next day would be Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, a day that we call Palm Sunday. And the scripture from John 12, 16 says the disciples did not understand still what was about to happen. Jesus has been explaining over and over to them what is to come. My life is coming short. I'm about to return to my Father. All this stuff He's been telling them. And the disciples were more worried about the money being spent on the poor than they were about thinking about Jesus. See, they showed a lack of preparation. They were not ready for what was to come. They had no idea what Jesus had been talking about the whole entire time that He had been on this earth and been around them. They weren't thinking about it. Many of us as Christians today, we have so many opportunities to prepare for our future. See, we have an advantage over the disciples because we already know that Jesus was dead, He was buried, and He was raised from the dead. We already know that. <coughs> we also know that there are very many witnesses to His resurrection. But I think oftentimes we're too busy being like Mark. We're too busy with our checklist of things that we have to come. Things that we have to prepare for. Things that we're trying to get done on this earth. Mowing the lawn. Washing the truck. Taking care of things that we do on a daily basis. Our normal job stuff. All of these things replace time that we can be sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning. It takes away from our time when we can spend true time in devotion to Jesus. I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say that I'm terrible about taking time for this. I'm in a class, uh, it's called Mentor Ministry. And as a part of this class, we have to fill out a journal on a weekly basis and on a monthly basis we turn it in. And in that journal I was talking about the fact that I wanted to take more time for devotion. And I was talking to the person that's mentoring me during this time and uh, I told him I have to find a way to make more time to do devotional. And he said, stop right there for a second. And I said, what? What did I say? He said, you said, I have to. It's not about the have to. It's about a want to. He said, you should want to have this devotional time with Jesus. You should want to have this time to build your relationship with our Savior, with our Lord. It's a privilege that we have to go to the Lord in prayer. It's a privilege that we have to read the Scriptures. And they're not in Greek, and they're not in Roman, they're not in any of these other texts. They're right here in the plain English Bible that we can all read. It's a privilege that we have these people who have devoted their lives to writing devotionals, daily devotionals, like uh, the upper room, things like that. And we have to take time to remember that. I hope that none of us are like Judas. I really do, because Judas is the far end of the spectrum of what it's not like to be a Christian. Because Judas was saying one thing and thinking an entirely different one. Judas is the ultimate opposite of what a Christian should be. Because he put on a good facade for everybody. He said, oh, I'm worried about the poor. I'm worried about the hungry. Why couldn't I have spent that money on that? But in his heart, he was thinking, I didn't get to steal a whole entire year's worth of wages. What is wrong with you people? I know that I end up being more like Martha than I should. And I know that it's easy to do in this world today where we have so much that we have to get accomplished. But I also know that it's a privilege as a Christian to get to know who Jesus really is. That's the privilege that each and every single one of us has. To get to really, really know Jesus. He wants us to have that relationship with Him. And He wants that relationship to grow. So I tell you all today, I want us all to try to be 
more like Mary. She knew what was important. Now that doesn't mean I want you all to go out and spend 100, 300, or a whole entire year's wages on some perfume and bring it up here and try to wash everybody's feet and all that stuff. And I don't think some of you have enough hair to do any drying, so we won't go into that. <laughs> but I do believe that it is highly important that we recognize the devotion that Mary had for Jesus. His devotion goes beyond anything that we can ever imagine. So as we come to our time of prayer, as we close the service today, I want us to be more like Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening. It's our privilege. It is our joy. It's not a have to. It's a want to. Let us pray. Our most precious and heavenly Father, we come to you this morning to say thank you. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for your word. We ask that you will guide us and direct us. Help us to remember to be more like Mary. And fill us with your love and your Holy Spirit. For it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. So we come to our closing hymn now. It's one of my favorites. Love lifted me. Let us all stand as we sing from the Coachberry 233 and on the screen. Father, fill our hearts with your love and your Holy Spirit. Guide us and direct us as we go through this week.